Hello, welcome. I'm Jan Mercer-Dom, President of U.S. Development with Joy Mayshad. We are an ecosystem of brands for women by women, connecting women to each other and to the companies, causes, and brands that champion equity for women professionally and personally. You are watching our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion show brought to you each and every week. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can learn about all of our upcoming content through our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion show, which again is this, our Women of Money show, and we kick off each and every week with Dr. Risa Reiger, one of our investors and clinical psychologists. Please also make sure to join us at joinmeisha.com where you can learn more about all of our upcoming workshops, brain trusts, and how you too can become a member of how we revolutionize how professional women network. I'm so incredibly thrilled and honored to introduce to all of you today, Dr. Maria Meyer. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here too. So this is going to be such an interesting conversation because you have such a really incredible eclectic history that forms who you are today. From National Geographic explorer and TV host, scientist, author, speaker, mom, and star in Travel Channel's Expedition Bigfoot, let's talk about how you got to where you are today. You've been on many global journeys yourself, many of which we'll talk about, but from NFL cheerleader to Fulbright scholar to PhD in anthropology to National Geographic Explorer, what has led you, what's driven you? It, uh, it reads like a wild novel, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it certainly has been. I, I did not take a typical journey into my, my current field. And I think that that's one of the things that I always tell women is that it's okay to veer off the path that you're heading down if something excites you and motivates you. And that's what happened to me. I am I grew up in a big city in Miami and I'm the only daughter of Cuban immigrants. So funny enough, my parents were incredibly overprotective. And when I asked them if I could join the Girl Scouts, they said, absolutely not. That is far too dangerous. Right. So at the time that I was an NFL cheerleader, I was also going uh, to university as an undergrad. I took this anthropology class and it was a science requirement that I needed to take. I was actually a pre-law student. I was very well on the way to becoming a lawyer. And I took this class and I fell in love with the idea of studying endangered primates in the wild. And I watched Gorillas in the Mist. And I remember the moment as I'm watching the screen and, you know, Diane Fossey is cuddling up to these beautiful mountain gorillas. And I thought, that is what I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> so <laughs> when I did that, I didn't even have a passport. I had never been camping before. I'd never been out of the country. And all of a sudden, I found myself in not just the wilds, but in one of the most remote and unexplored regions of the Amazon with no experience, with all the wrong equipment. And it was a steep learning curve, but you know, here I am. <laughs> you, you mentioned that you're Cuban American mm -hmm. and at Mesha, we talk a lot about identity and how complex identity really is. And that usually when we label people, we think of binary constructs, you're either male or you're female, mm -hmm. you're either heterosexual or homosexual, you're either, either this or either that. Talk to us about how your own identity has really brought richness to how you think about your own position in the world and the lens through which you see others. So this is a, a very common thread in STEM when we're talking about women in STEM. It's not just about what their interests are or what they were exposed to growing up. It also has a lot to do with the, the, the cultural construct in which they grew up in. And for me, you know, I was first generation to go to college. Uh, my family had really planned for me a, a more traditional career path. You know, um, my cousins are, are teachers and, and my mom was a nurse. And these are all roles that were expected sort of growing up. And so I think that plays a really large part in, in what we end up doing with our lives. And so I, I see that over and over when I give lectures around the country, for example, for National Geographic, you know, the I have girls who come up to me and will say, could you talk to my mom? Because she probably wouldn't want me to do this. And, you know, we have very similar upbringings or they'll say, um, you know, I I love to dance or I'm an artist and I didn't know that I could also be a scientist. And 
for me, I grew up, again, an only daughter um, in this Cuban family. I was the ultimate girly girl. My mom used to, uh, you know, put on the pretty dresses. My grandmother used to make them for me. And shift years later, where I'm still into, you know, makeup and fashion and all of those things, it was hard to sell myself, for example, in the field, in graduate school, because of my appearance. And in the very beginning of my career, my academic career, I remember trying to lose some of that femininity in order to fit in. And very quickly, I thought, I'm actually not only not going to lose it, I'm going to embrace it and highlight it. And that's actually why the title of my book, Pink Boots and a Machete, I started sporting these bright pink boots in the field because I wanted very much to highlight the fact that I was a woman and that, that I usually the only woman out there on the expedition and that I was an effective leader. And so that was okay. I wanted to change that stereotype. You know, you've been referred to as the female Indiana Jones. <laughs> How does that label make you feel given, given everything you just, you just told to us, told us now? It's very funny. I get asked that quite a lot. And, you know, I, I understand why the media describes me as a female Indiana Jones, because it's a quick reference description that most people will get right away. And there aren't a lot of women doing what I do at the, at the media forefront, right? So there's a lot of women who are doing expeditions and great scientific work, and, but they're not at that TV forefront where people can, can identify them right away. And, uh, I, What's funny about that story is that a couple years ago, I met Harrison Ford and we had dinner and I said to him, for just one night, you're going to be the male Dr. Maria Mayer. <laughs> because I have been the female Indiana Jones all these years. <laughs> and we played along and it was great. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you have, you know, the the blend of the the technical skill from the science perspective, but then you're also this incredible media personality as well. How did that evolve over time? And did one thing lead to the other in the sense of the way in which you planned your career? So my career was pretty unplanned, right? As many great things in life are, but I was I was in the field in Madagascar when National Geographic came to do a completely different type of film. They were looking at the predator that eats the lemurs that I was studying in Madagascar. <laughs> and because this animal is so rare and so elusive, um, they couldn't capture any footage of it. So they turned to me and said, could you talk to us about these lemurs? And so I did. And the uh, producer became really interested in the work that I was doing. I was studying two of the most endangered primates in the world that they'd never been studied before. They'd never even been photographed. So they came back and I did a one hour documentary. And then the next thing I know, I got offered a position as National Geographic's first female wildlife correspondent. And I had a really big decision to make at that point because up until that point, I was strictly a, you know, an, an academic researcher pursuing a career in academia. And Taking on the role of a media personality really affects them. But for me, science communication is the, probably one of the most valuable things that a scientist can embrace because it doesn't matter if we're collecting a lot of really important, valuable data if we don't communicate that to the world to care more, to become aware, and to really start making uh, decisions in their daily lives that affects these these animals and these wild places. So I knew that as a as a, you know as a TV correspondent that I would have a much broader, bigger audience than I would in any classroom. And so that's why I took on on that role. And it did become a very natural transition for me because I really enjoy talking about the stuff that I do. I'm very passionate about this. The sciences, I'm very passionate about the places that I go and explore. So this is a really good fit for me. And I felt that ultimately it would do a lot more good than simply collecting data that would then languish in files. Yeah, it's such, a, such an interesting point. And I think that there's so much space for those of us in academia to actually take 
um, take pause with what you just said, because I think that in this world now, particularly because of COVID, so much of what we're going to be doing is communicating in this way. And I think particularly for women, you know, we often have a tendency to not think big, right? And so it's often, you know, many of us refer to this time as the go big or go home moment in time that's really going to really define what comes next in our careers. And figuring out those ways that you can be seen and heard and valued and respected for your knowledge and your expertise, rather than waiting for something, an opportunity to come to you, like going out there and grabbing it. And that sounds like much of what you've done throughout your career. And I love the fact that it hasn't been planned. I love that because... (laughs) I, I am one to grab opportunities. And, <laughs> and so uh, it's one of the reasons that I've moved back to Miami. Florida International University offered me a position as the director of exploration and science communications. And that to me was yet another huge opportunity to not only keep conveying the message and being at that televisual forefront, which I think is so important for women uh, in, to be a mentor and to really have someone that women can, you know, relate to uh, and and want to follow it maybe in those footsteps and be inspired by. And this position at FIU gave me that opportunity because not only am I getting to do what I love, I'm getting that to share that with other professors, with other graduate students, other students who perhaps are amazing scientists but haven't quite figured out yet how to communicate that science. And I think it's so important that we really take that responsibility very serious, that all of this important work that we're doing, it needs to be out there for it to really matter. I want to come back to that as well, but something you said earlier around knowing when to seize an opportunity. Let's dive deeper into that a bit, because I think for so many of us, we often think about, and this is going to be very gendered, what I'm going to say now, but we often think about, um, you know, through a gendered lens, through the gendered eye, there's a perception that women have about ourselves where we have to be perfect before we stick the toe in the water, right? Whereas men are more often than not just to take risks to see what happens, right? And so how in your past have you been able to evaluate opportunities, even it comes from that place of just intuition, um, to know when it's important to just throw something up against a wall to see if it's sticky. And you've just said it, it's following your intuition. And I'm a firm believer in that. You know, I have six children, five of them are girls. And I am very careful to not say, oh, be careful. Don't run so fast. Don't do this. You know, it, that that's sort of that caution that we tend to put more on girls than, than we do on on, on boys. And so for me, I was an explorer at heart since I was a kid. And I really did have a lot of freedom, you know, running around the streets of Miami and exploring, you know, the, the different mango trees and climbing up as high as I could and jumping down and catching the wild animals that, that really were lucky enough to have everywhere. And so I think not, you know, I think seeing those opportunities for what they are, which, you know, they're, they're moments that may never happen again. And so my whole thing is I'm more afraid of having regret than I am of anything else. So that fear of regret sort of overrides any other fear or or doubt that I might have. And so generally my attitude is to go for it because what do I have to lose? The, 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 the only worst thing will be to regret not having done something or or tried something or taken that risk. Such good advice. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, we often also learn so much from things that didn't go according to plan. Right. And you can refer to them as mistakes or errors, but I could like to call them learning life lessons. (laughs) And have you had, (laughs) have you had some of those learning life lessons where now in hindsight, you look back at something and say, I wonder what would happen if I would have done this differently. Um, It's funny. I think I look back and, you know, so much of what I've done throughout my career is actually on film. So I can literally look back and and (laughs) unfold. And there are times where I I can't believe I'm still uh, here because of all the risks that I've taken. And 
so much of it really is calculated risk. You know, I know what I'm getting myself into, um, but I, I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest, because even the things that were mistakes I learned from and, and those mistakes actually created other opportunities and opened other doors. So there's not much that I look back on and think, oh, I wish I'd never done that. Or that was just complete. You know, there are things I look back on and think that was completely crazy. What was I thinking? Or my mom, for example, will watch (laughs) really standing that close to a, to a spinning cobra. (laughs) And 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 I say, well, apparently, yes, I was right. (laughs) Um, Probably a mistake in hindsight, but it's, you know, all of the, the journeys that I've taken so far has, have taught me so much and have made me so more better prepared for, for what's next. Let's talk, like go back to the theme of communication and talk more about the fact that um, we're still in the middle of COVID-19, COVID-20. And that's really shaken up so many different industries. I mean, honestly, it's shaken up every aspect of our professional and personal lives. And you're in a, in a discipline, in a space, in an industry, film and TV and, and science, where no doubt there's so much that's happening right now because of COVID. Uh, from a business perspective, how is it impacting the work that you're doing in the sense of you know, continuing to be actually go on expeditions and to film and, and to shoot? Well, yes, COVID has definitely disrupted just about every aspect <laughs> of what I do, for example, all of the lectures that I give around the country to different um, audiences and in public, you know, theaters and, and venues, universities, schools, that has all come to a halt. Um, filming that has been po- postponed um, for months and months and months, and and we're just now sort of getting underway with those projects. But even with a lot of challenges and difficulties that may may or may not make it possible. Uh, with my university setting, the universities are closed at the moment. And as far as my research and being able to uh, be what I call muddy boots conservation, which is being on the ground, really protecting these places and these animals, that has also completely stopped because of travel restrictions and, and different safety issues. So, you know, the, the global fight to save endangered species has been hugely affected around the world, and that's hugely concerning. I think that what the pandemic has done has created new and different opportunities to do the things that we do differently. I mean, here we are right now, we're having this great conversation, and we're doing it in a very different way than we would have done it in the past. And the same thing goes for uh, conservationists who are trying to protect these places. You know, so many, um, like Nepal, for example, illegal forcing has more than doubled since the lockdown. Uh, places around Africa that rely so heavily on ecotourism. We're having to think and create new ways of how do we bring these wild places to people while they cannot travel, and how do we keep local people's revenues alive? How do we continue to protect these animals? And it's making us think very, very differently. The great thing about humans is that we're highly adaptable and innovative, and and we're coming up with new ways and different ideas. The other, let's call it silver lining to this pandemic, if there is one, is that I think people are a lot more aware of nature and its role and its importance. I mean, never has the world been brought to its needs in the way that it has now. And it really has to do with the way that we have disrespected and treated our natural environment. And I think that's a really valuable lesson out of all of this is that going forward, you know, scientists have long been warning about the effects of climate change and deforestation um, and how that leads to more Uh, interaction with wild animals. I mean, so many of these diseases have always been out there, but our interaction is much greater now. Uh, You have these these wet markets, you have all of these different circumstances that lead to pandemics. And so I think this is a true eye-opener, and hopefully we will take the lessons from this and moving forward, make better decisions. I wanted so many, so many questions to unpack from this, this part of the conversation. Um, I want to talk a bit about, you know, the benefits and to the environment that, um, that we think that we're experiencing right now. And 
so many of us that are really passionate about climate change and sustainability in so many different types of industries from supply chain to um, to eco-friendly fashion to eco-friendly tourism and hospitality to just you know helping companies help employees think through these things differently as well. I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, we also know that Americans can have short um, attention spans and short memories. And do you think in, you know, whether it's another year, or two years that we return to something that more than not resembled the past, right? What are the longer term learning lessons that you hope that we retain from this period of time that are really going to move the needle forward as it pertains to climate change and sustainability and then, and then coupled in the work that you do? I think one of the things that started happening at the beginning of these lockdowns is people started noticing animals more and more in their daily lives and, and their just backyards, their natural environment. Uh, people were asking me, are there more birds now? And if, if, first of all, it happened in the spring time, which is when birds are sort of at their loudest, right? So the timing on that was good. But I think also what you were seeing was a reduction in noise pollution. There were just less cars on the road. There was less construction going on. Um, people started seeing animals that they hadn't seen in years, if ever, in you know their, their local beaches or their lakes. And it, these animals were coming closer and closer. Part of it had to do with that noise reduction, but also the fact that the water was suddenly clear. And you could see these animals. And so there were a lot of moments that I think really struck people um, where they were enjoying the, the peace of it all and the, and the wonder of nature that surrounds them all the time that they didn't either have the time to pay attention to or, or, or you know, just didn't notice before. So I'm hoping that those are the bits that people take from this and move forward that we don't have to be as reliant and dependent on, you know, gas guzzling cars that you could really thrive, you know, at home and enjoy the wonders of this nature and want to protect it. Maria, diving a bit deeper in this, you talk a lot about the intersectionality of wildlife trafficking and poverty and political instability. Mm -hmm. How is that going to play out from your perspective, given the sense that the world's in so much disruption right now and in the ways in which so much of the work that you do has been halted for so many different reasons, but largely coming back to COVID, do you see that as a threat? It's most definitely a threat. And we're seeing that in very many different ways. I recently wrote a piece about bonobos, um, just great apes that are being poached in Africa. And we're seeing that that rate is actually increasing right now because so much of the local economy does depend on eco wildlife tourism um, that and and people manning these these crimes that are no longer able to do so or have become sick from covid and and can't do so and so unfortunately the criminal activity um, has increased in a lot of parts of the world where these animals are already threatened this is going to be one of the the tougher challenges where conservationists are going to have to think very differently in how we empower local people to fight wildlife trafficking. Uh, on the other hand, now that people are acutely aware of what can happen when you're exposing yourself to animals that should not be being brought over from different parts of the world and taken out of their wild natural habitats, hopefully there will be uh, you know, a, a reduction in the demand for that, you know, like local bush meat and, and that sort of thing. But it's a tricky one because while this feels like we've been experiencing it for a really long time, in the grand scheme of things, we don't know enough yet at this point to know what the long-term effects are going to be. What, what we do know is that national parks have had to shut down. So, for example, you can no longer visit the, the majestic mountain gorillas in Rwanda. This is giving the animals and, and the wilderness a break but it's also posing different threats for the, for the local people and their economies. I would love to hear about your very first expedition. <laughs> and then the last one, the last travel that you did, either right before COVID shut everything down or, or since COVID has shut everything down. Mm -hmm. And 
thinking back on expe expedition number one versus your your most recent one, what have you learned about yourself during that time period, during that that tenure? I was actually supposed to be in Africa right now. <laughs> uh, so my first expedition was to Guyana, and it was a very remote, unexplored region of the Amazon. And I was living out of a dugout canoe for several months. I had nothing more than just uh, a, a little inadequate teddy bear backpack <laughs> and uh, some, some field shorts and a field t-shirt and a vest and uh, some hiking boots that were also very ill-fitting. And I had no idea what I was doing. I packed a tent and quickly discovered that tents in the Amazon are um, a big no-no because of the very venomous snakes that are on the ground. So I needed to buy a local hammock. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life though. And I had just come off fresh off the football field as an NFL cheerleader, right? So talk about vastly different, but it was such an amazing uh, way to, to really disconnect from it all, especially at the time that I started, which was a two decades ago where, you know, cell phones were not a thing and I couldn't afford to have any other piece of high tech that kept me communicating to back home. But suddenly there I was waking up to the sounds of hyacinth macaws and howler monkeys and running around, you know, chasing uh, spider monkeys. And, and it, it was just incredible. So that was my very first expedition where I was, I was also coming across all of these villages where many of them had never seen a foreigner and they were taking me in, you know, kind of like you would a, a cute puppy you found <laughs> and teaching me the ropes and teaching me how to create their, you know, the local delicacies. Um, and it was an eye opening experience, especially one particular family that took me in who happened to be uh, wildlife traders. I had no idea. And they asked me if I would join them on one of their expeditions and of course, I was really torn by this, but I saw that as an opportunity to learn how many animals were being taken out of the forest and how and what kinds. And that was really the point where I became a conservationist, where to me, it wasn't just about the collection of data and learning about an animal's behavior and diet. It was really about knowing how do we best protect them and what areas are in the greatest need of protection. So that was a real life changer for me on, on that very first expedition. And um, one of my, my last expeditions was back in Madagascar, where probably where my heart lives. <laughs> and it's a very special place to me, um, wonderful people, very generous. And for a scientist, it's a dream come true because of the wondrous um, habitats that are very different from, from coast to coast, the amazing animals that occur nowhere else on the planet, most of which are under threat of becoming extinct. So this place was really special. And then to discover a new species with my colleague while we were on an expedition was the highlight of my career. Because you, you go into the sciences and you hope that one day you might make a discovery, but you don't really plan on it or, or think that you will. So this was incredible in so many ways personally, but also what, what came after that was a National Geographic photographer accompany, accompanied me on one of my trips and photographed me with this new little mouse lemur. And I was able to take these pictures and information to the then president and prime minister of Madagascar who then declared the area a national park. And that to me was the biggest payoff of all because suddenly, you know, the world's smallest primate, right, weighs less than two ounces and fits in the palm of your hand, had become a huge ambassador for all things wild in Madagascar and was protecting not only its own habitat, but the habitat of thousands of other species that only occur there. So, you know, the, that that to me was one of the most special expeditions. That and the first one are probably my two favorite all-time expeditions. Although I say that in every expedition I'm on, <laughs> I'm on is my favorite. And I'll be right at the end of one and I'm planning the next one. So I have a, a, have a habit of falling in love with these wild places and, and all of the animals that I'm studying. 
you know, it's it's fascinating because you've had so many really unique life altering experiences on your expeditions, um, and and really surrounding yourself with people from different cultures and and different experiences and different professional and personal journeys. And this is our, as you know, our diversity, equity, and inclusion show. And we usually talk about this theme from a corporate perspective in the sense of everything from unconscious bias to workplace policies. But I'm wondering, you know, as a global traveler, share with us what experiences have meant for you from the perspective of opening your mind to people who don't look like you, to people who may have had very different upbringings or very different experiences. And what has that taught you about humanity? Well, fortunately, I grew up in... Miami, which is an incredibly culturally diverse place. And so the the thought of not looking like anyone else was just not even on my radar because I, I kind of never looked like anyone else that, that I was around. Um, my family, you know, we were a minority at some point, although not so much anymore. Um, but my family had always... Um, um, you know, brought me up to accept different cultures and, 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 and people who look different. So this was never an issue for me. What I learned on these expeditions is that without the, the help and knowledge of the local people, I could have never succeeded. And their knowledge of those areas, for example, I trekked across Africa uh, about a thousand miles with the help of Maasai warriors. I have never seen a, the skill <laughs> that I learned from them ever in my professional career, the way that they know how to uh, protect themselves and create shelters. And we, wa- we would walk into an ancient forest mm-hmm. and we see trees and they see a medicine cabinet. They see a grocery store. It's pretty remarkable. So if anything, you know, I always felt inadequate <laughs> in all of these places because their knowledge, you know, that I, I spent some time in Suriname with a shaman. Again, when they look at these trees, they know what every part of the plant stem root does and treats. And it's, it's pretty o- o- overwhelming, um, but also very humbling because it, we tend to think as Westerners that we have so much, you know, science and technology at our disposal, but the way that I see it, you take away that, (laughs) you know, you strip that away and the knowledge of the people who are said not to have very much is so much greater. And I think that there's a lot of wealth in that. Let's talk a bit about the use of technology and particularly in the, at the time of COVID, many of us are relying on technology to do really everything, right? Like you and I are having this conversation. We connected originally on social media. Um, so there's tremendous good that can come from the way in which we utilize technology, even during the pandemic. We also know that, you know, for, for human beings, that there's a downside to technology in the sense of everything from eye strain to, um, to fear and anxiety and the, 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 you know, the acronym FOMO, which was never an acronym, never a thing, you know, up until a couple of years ago, to just the ways in which technology may be harming our health, both emotionally and physically. Um, do you see the role of technology also impacting the work that you do with animals? And if so, in what ways? Oh, sure. So, so I don't know how much of this you want me to, to repeat back for the interview. So, but basically, you know, it's, Technology is a double-edged sword because it does create a lot of stress and anxiety and, and you know, physical um, changes within our, our mind and eye strain and, and back problems, all of these things that we tend to associate with technology. But during a time like this, um, technology also makes these places that we can't access physically possible. And that's a, that plays a big role in, in science and, and conservation. Uh, being able to, for example, uh, use camera traps to monitor animals in the wild, being able to communicate with, with, uh, with the local trackers um, and the local conservation authorities in places across the world, that also becomes possible. Um, there's also well, the, the simple technology of, of media and filming and being able to do stuff like this, which 
helps to raise awareness. Um, and so I think that without technology, we would actually be in a much worse place than we are now because it does allow us to do so many other things. I mean, GPS tracking, um, you know, artificial intelligence to uh, protect reefs, which is one of the projects that Florida International University is now undertaking. There are so many different things that we can do with technology that if we are not able to physically be there ourselves, we are still able to somewhat monitor and in a sense be there to keep doing this research and keep protecting these places. What should we as, as individual human beings understand about kind of the delicate balance between how we participate in an environment, how we participate in nature and ensuring that we're doing everything in our power to actually help protect um, species and, and animals and wildlife, even if we're not working directly in your field? There's things that we can do in our everyday lives that come down to very simple things that everyone, of course, is aware of, like recycling and saving water and turning off the lights, all of these things. But I think to on a bigger scale, uh, the choices that we make to buy things, where those products are coming from, what materials are being used, where they're being sourced from, consumerism plays a large, large role in climate change and, and the destruction of our environment. I think we've come to a point uh, that it's very easy to toss something out and buy a new one. And I think that we have to get better ab about repurposing and about fixing things and not having this huge demand because that puts a very big strain on, on the natural environment. You know, it's interesting you say this because I also think that during this time of COVID that we're, we, are actually spending less mm -hmm. because we're, you know, we're at home. We're not out in the public space as much. Right. Um, and I think we are questioning choices that we're making in different ways. So it'll be interesting to see, like, as we, as we start to come to life more and more, yeah. you know, if we still make the same choices that we're making right now, and if we're going to be in this long enough where they actually become learned behaviors that we just then repeat over and over again, because we're realizing we can live with less. Absolutely. And I, I hope so. I mean, one of the things that I think is, really important and I've gotten really into is thrifting, for example, right? So that that's one way, but even now we have the time to research brands and see what's in those brands, how those chemicals or whatever affect the natural environment, or if you're talking about clothing, uh, is it an eco-friendly brand? And I think that it poses a little bit of a challenge when you're shopping, but it's like a fun challenge because if you're able to score something that you really love and you it's feel good because you know that you're you know doing something positive um, by by buying that I, I think that's something that hopefully people will take out of this and, and move forward with it after post COVID. <laughs> you are an incredible mother as well as being a scientist and, and a rock star in your in your field. Um, Talk to us a bit about what has, even leading up to this moment in time that's so unique to our history, the, the time of COVID, but what has being a mother and a role model meant for you in the sense of how you've raised your, your children? It's funny because even before I had children, when I was in Madagascar, for example, and I'd be in a local village where the kids had never actually even seen a lemur, even though they only occur in Madagascar, I started taking them into the field so that they could experience uh, the, the wonders of this place where they live and want to protect these animals. And I remember at that time, again, not I didn't have kids at that time, but thinking, I want to make sure these animals are here so that I can bring my own children mm -hmm. one day. And that's something that has stayed with me. And I now have six and they've traveled with me to different parts of the world. Uh, my, my now 12 year old went to Madagascar a couple of years ago with me and fell in love like I did and, and wants to be an explorer. Um, my oldest would go with me when she was as young as 10 months old and, and growing up. And so they each, each one in their own way has been exposed to these beautiful wild places and the cult, different cultures. And I think it's really important because for me, I want them to be people who are open-minded and on, um, you know, 
non afraid and not uh, critical and and just really see the world for what it is, which is a really beautiful and wondrous place filled of all sorts of different cultures and practices. And I, I, I think they'd just be happier people for it. A lot of what I do has always been thinking about, am, am I leading, you know, by example, I've had so many women reach out to me after a lecture or after reading my book and say, this has propelled me to want to finish school or get out there and really do something that means a lot to me or follow my dream. And in that same way, I'm hoping that I'm giving that same example to my kids, because as you know, one of the things that moms suffer from is mom guilt and I am no different. And so, you know, when I'm home, I'm of course dreaming of the wilds and the, and the important things that I want to be doing out there but when I'm out there, I'm thinking about missing dance recitals or, or a baseball game and, and that sort of thing. And it's trying to juggle that balance. And by no way have I figured out what it is. We just do what works for us. But one of the things that even with that mom guilt that keeps me pursuing what I love is the thought that all my children, male and female alike, are watching their mom do something that they love that they're pursuing their dreams and that they can have a family and do that as well. And I think that's a really important lesson for kids growing up so that they don't have an expectation of what a mom or, or a woman, you know, should be doing with their life. It's like they can do it all. And that's what I try to, that's the impression I try to leave on them. That's so beautiful. I think, you know, it's interesting to hear what you just said, because I think also in this moment in time, so many women and, and men too, honestly, are really questioning their own identity because as we know, there are over 50 million um, Americans that have filed unemployment claims. Women are overrepresented in, in most of the, the industries um, under that number. Um, and many of us are balancing so much under the roof, right? Like we're living, we're working, we're thinking about the future, we're homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. And that can really rock kind of the core foundation of how you think about yourself, right? And how you show up in the world on a daily basis. And, you know, there's so much, even less now, of the blurring of the lines between, you know, work and personal, right? It's kind of just all one thing. Yeah. So what advice, given what you just said, what advice do you have out there for other women who are trying to balance so many different things in this in this new world right now? <laughs> other than <laughs> a good lock on your door when you're doing these interviews. <laughs> I'm surprised no one has run in. You know, it's, that is such a personal thing because what works for me may not work for others. And so again, I don't know that I have figured it all out. I know that I love my children more than life itself. And, uh, I love what I do, you know, very much. And it's about, in a sense now there, you know, it, it is blended, but I, I look at it as an opportunity to share, share the two with them. Um, I think that having more time to spend with them and talk about like we were going through all of these uh, nature books the other day with the kids and they were asking me questions about different expeditions that I've been on and different animals that I've worked with. And that was like a really special moment that I had had I been out of the house, either on expedition or at the university wouldn't have happened. Um, ha having said that, it's not easy. You know, like the, it's not easy to, to juggle the two because as you said, we're, we're worrying about the, the, the family life, the, the work life. And I don't think that there's an easy answer, but just doing what fits best within, within your family. You know, I love what you said earlier around the fact that you really love what you do. And I think that's so incredibly important because that's the energy that you exude to others as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's from a like attracts like sort of, I guess, mindset. It's the energy that you put out there is the energy you get back. And clearly, like you're so passionate about the work that you do. And it's important on so many different levels. Right. Like from mm -hmm. a from, from the micro to the macro in the sense of what you're doing and making the world a better place. So I want to talk about something that I love the show, Expedition Bigfoot. Right. Let's talk about the evolution of that um, and what do you hope to accomplish through the show? I mean, obviously finding Bigfoot. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah, I want to find Bigfoot. Um, 
So it's funny because I was approached to come on board with the show as this show scientist to help ground the subject matter, right? Which has not received an incredible amount of scientific um, attention or support with exceptions, of course. And I was a, le a little bit leery at first because I wasn't sure how I even felt about the subject. But what I really loved about the premise um, for this is that I would get to conduct a scientific expedition in a way that I, I always have. So whether I was out searching for Western lowland gorillas or lemurs or, you know, monkeys, I was going to lead this expedition in the same way. And I looked at this as a very good opportunity to get the, the science behind that out, because no matter what it is that you're looking for, a lot of the skills that I employ as a primatologist, Bigfoot researchers are out there also doing. So I thought, well, this could be a really cool way to really talk to an audience that I don't have a lot of access to, right? And explain the scientific methodology behind all of this, but also bring the wonders of nature and exploration to people's homes as well, because at the end of the day, science is about answering questions that remain unanswered. Certainly Bigfoot is one of the most popular unanswered <laughs> questions out there, right? But it's also about inspiring uh, people to to want to be out there in nature and exploring. It is also about sometimes exploring and not finding what you're looking for, but finding other things, which has happened on, on numerous expeditions where you're searching for for one particular species, you don't find it, but you uncover a different one that you didn't know was there or you rediscover. So I feel that the value of, of, of exploring is never undermined by what you're searching for. And that to me was the most important factor in making my decision to join the show. And it's been an incredible experience. I mean, I work with a great team. Uh, I do tend to to ground a certain things because if I see a print or hear a noise, I'm not the one jumping up and down saying it's a, it's a thing, but, yeah, you know, <laughs> whereas others might, I'm the one saying, okay, well, let's think about what's here and what it could be or what it's not. Um, but for me and, and for any scientist, it comes down to the tangible evidence that you can present to the scientific community and where experiments can be replicated. So it, it's a difficult process, but it doesn't take away from just the like amazing fun that it is to be out there in nature and to explore and to possibly, I mean, talk about a career going full circle, co-discovering the world's smallest and then possibly the biggest, right? So there's nothing to lose in that case. <laughs> So it's, you know, it's so fascinating. Um, what is the, from your perspective as a scientist, what is the lure behind kind of the, the mythology of Bigfoot? Is it seeing something that's so not a part of what you expect to see, or is there something different? It's pretty incredible. And I think that actually you just touched upon something that I didn't mention before, but one of the other reasons I thought this was a really worthwhile search is you have thousands tens of thousands of witnesses coming forward, talking about their experience. And even if, even if all of those except one is not true, that one warrants the search. And so a lot of people who have come forward, and I learned this through the process of these expeditions, have a lot to lose. Some of them are police officers or they're psychologists, important members of their society, that they are afraid of coming forward because they don't want to be ridiculed. And then when you hear them tell their stories and you see how they are still to the day shaken to the core or affected by whatever it is that they experience, I want to treat that with the due respect that it deserves. Because I, in my own expeditions, have talked to local people in order to find what I'm looking for. And a lot of them have described things that we never knew existed who that turned out to be true. So, you know, Jane Goodall, who is certainly one of my heroes and I think so many others, I once saw her do an interview and they asked her about Bigfoot and they asked her, 
is it, you know, do you believe in Bigfoot? And she said uh, the same thing that I feel, which is I believe anything is possible, right? She said, I hope it is, I hope it is real, right? So I can't, when people ask me, do you believe in Bigfoot? Well, it's, it's not a religion, is it? So it doesn't matter what I believe, but I want to be able to either find the evidence that it would take to finally take this, this mythical creature out of the legend dairy books and into the science text or to finally put it to rest. But either way, I feel like there's, there's a good search and everyone loves a good mystery. I think there's some really important words of wisdom that just are coming out from what you just said as well, in the sense of that open-mindedness, right, to something that you may not actually believe in from a religious perspective, right? But believe in the sense of possibility and believe in the, believe in your heart to being open to thinking about things in different ways. And I think that this is what this moment in time is teaching so many of us as well, right? To really be open to the sense of possibility, to know that you may have to reinvent your career, to pivot, to transform yourself, maybe a few different times yet, um, because it's a, a, it's a completely disruptive period of time. Yes, it is an ever-changing landscape. And <laughs> that's one of the things that I feel I've gotten most out of expeditions that has played such a huge role in how I parent and in how I manage my, my career and, and my life. And that is to be resilient and to anticipate change. I mean, on expeditions, I always have a plan A, plan B, plan C, and sometimes a plan D, and you can expect to get there. And that's the same thing in, in life. You know, no matter what you're dealing with, you and embrace the change, pivot with it. And like I said, humans are incredibly innovative. We're resilient. We're tough. We can make things work. We just have to be open to the possibility of change. Do you think for also for women is actually giving ourselves permission to make change as well, right? And to feel like even if you don't have it all completely figured out, that's okay. Like going to the earlier part of the point of our conversation as well, um, that just getting out there and trying something, getting out there and sticking your toe in the water, getting out there and knowing that it's not going to be perfect and that's okay. Oh, absolutely. I think that and I suffer from, you know, perfectionism as well. <laughs> you know, it's, it comes a point where you let yourself take the risk. You let yourself make the mistake. You learn from that mistake and you forgive yourself because it's okay. You're, you're human. It, it, I think it's far worse not to take that risk or make that mistake and learn from it. And one of the things that I notice over and over is that we are our own limit setters you know we we kind of create that box around us and so not pigeonholing ourselves into a particular role or place and just allowing ourselves the freedom to no pun intended explore and explore <laughs> different options and try those different things is probably one of the best gifts we could give ourselves as women and it's so true because I think that there's a lot of unpacking that sometimes women need to go through just in the sense of unlearning some of those lessons that they were taught earlier on in their own socialization processes, right? Right around like girls shouldn't do this or don't run too fast, don't play too hard. Right. Um, you know, all of those things that become so ingrained into just our, our subconscious nature and state of being and using this time to really unpack that and to say, okay, that was the past. This is who I want to be going forward. Absolutely. And using this as that excuse moment in time to actually do something different. I, you, you said it perfectly. I can't <laughs> back to that. Yes. <laughs> so here's my last question for you. A lot of people like to ask, what advice would you give to your 16 year old self? But let's say that you have an opportunity to talk to your 80 year old self. What would you tell her today? Um, stay fearless. <laughs> it's so funny. I recently, uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, let's say at heights. And I'm a, and I, and I think I am a little bit claustrophobic as well. And I recently, just in the last few weeks, uh, did some cave exploration and it really brought those two fears into one place. And I continued on and I did what I had to do. And I came out of it thinking like, I, I did it and, and I can still do it. And so at 80, I want to keep that mentality of 
I can still do it. And, uh, and really, and, and it's that attitude of staying fearless. I don't want to get ever to a point where I think, you know, oh, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to place limits on myself. So um, I'll remember to jot this down and hand to my 80-year-old self. <laughs> sure, you can still go run a few miles. I know it. <laughs> your, your personal time capsule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I think it, I think it's such good advice because I think that it's you know as we as we get older we tend to take less risks right because for for a lot of different reasons um, but I like the the fearless factor and thinking about um, you know what is the life you want to live um, and you know who do you want to be when you grow up <laughs> and it's funny because you just made me think well what advice would I have given myself at sixteen and it would probably have been how I live now is don't care about what anyone else thinks. Such I think advice. at 16, mm-hmm. I cared too much about what anyone else thought. And once I started living the life that I wanted to live without second thought to what others thought about it or that sort of thing, it really gives you an, a, a power and a freedom that, that I wish I had had as a teenager. That's really, really, really good advice. And I think so true. And, and honestly, that, that advice holds true for women at all ages as well. Because I think that there's still a tendency that we tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves um, because there's a perception that we as women are also putting pressure on each other as well, right? That it's not just a gender construction, but there's actually work happening behind the scenes in the sense of us feeling we need to not necessarily impress men but actually impress each other and that can become very and, and probably well. sometimes that's more the pressure absolutely so I think that women supporting women is probably one of the most important initiatives and things that we can do to really lift each other up let's in closing today's episode let's also talk about the power of networking because you and i connected originally we're facebook friends yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the power of social media and things like Instagram and, and Facebook and, and LinkedIn to really make me really meaningful connections, I think is really important. But also I love what you just said around women supporting each other as well and finding those, you know, those unique ways to be able to connect with people who may not be in your industry or may not be in your, your state or your country even, but, you know, exploring via social media, those some points of common connection that can bring you closer together to other people. I mean, social media is one of the things that I use most to connect to people who watch my shows or, uh, you know, read my book and hearing their perspectives or how it may have impacted their lives or suggestions that they have has been amazing. And I get messages not, you know, from all over the world. And that's something that wouldn't be possible. The same is true for using social media to protect our environment and bring so many of these amazing places and animals that people ordinarily don't have the chance to see and making them fall in love with them that way. And then they think, wow, I've never, I never knew that about this animal. I've never seen it, but now they care, right? Cause that's one of the things that I think is so important when you know something you learn, you know, you know, you can love it and you can want to protect it. So social media is great for that and for introducing us, of course. <laughs> So in closing, how do our viewers stay connected with you? If they would like to connect with you and learn more about your work and, and watch you, obviously, as well. Sure. Well, if they want to come to my website, it's www.mareamayer.com. And I'm on Instagram and I have a page on Facebook and Twitter. And any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do tend to post a lot about my expeditions on, on Instagram and every once in a while a cute kid. <laughs> Dr. Maria Mayer, thank you so much for being with us here today. We'd love to have you back as again as you um, travel even more and learn about your expeditions and your discoveries and your life learning lessons. Thank you for being with us. I would love that. Thank you so much. Stay safe. You're welcome. Thank you everyone for staying with us. My name is Jan Mercer Doms, the Vice President of US Development with Joy Mayshad. Please again, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out at joinmisha.com. We'd love to have you join us on our journey. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.